Yeah, yeah that's yeah, good. I agree. I agree. I agree. Good. Okay, we're rolling both cameras. You rolling? Okay, let's start. Madam Secretary, could you tell me a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing, and, and your parents' expectations for you? Well, I had uh, what is now viewed as a pretty typical um, upbringing and family. My father was a World War II veteran. My mother had never gone to college, but was devoted to uh, raising us. And I was given a great education in public schools in Park Ridge, Illinois. Uh, and I feel incredibly uh, grateful to my parents, the way they raised me, their expectations for me. And my father had been a football player in college, uh, kind of rough and tumble sort of a guy, but he was just as supportive of my aspirations as of my brothers. And my mother in part because she was of the <clears throat> generation that felt like um, she wanted to see her daughter have every opportunity available, encouraged me to just go as far as I could go. Your mother had faced some <clears throat> adversity. What did you learn from her? My mother had a much tougher upbringing than nearly anybody I knew. It was quite difficult. But I, I just inherited her sense of resilience and hopefulness and enthusiasm for life, uh, that uh, no matter you know, what happened to you, you couldn't maybe control that, but what you could try to control was how you responded to it. You said that your family, your father, treated you very equitably. What about in the outside world? Were you ever conscious that opportunities, your opportunities, might be limited? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I played a lot of sports when I was growing up, and you know, there was always the proving uh, ground that you had to try to uh, uh, make it clear you could compete on the playing field. Uh, when I was in uh, junior high school, I was totally entranced by the NASA program and wanted to go into space and wrote off a letter. And NASA wrote back and said, sorry, we don't take women, uh, which was the first time anybody had ever said to me in a really official way, besides, you know, boys on the playground, sorry, you can't do something because you're a girl. I mean, you really um, saw your, your future in a different way than the future for your mother's generation. Was there a point at which you thought, hey, politics might be in my future here? Not originally. I never thought of that. I, I liked uh, working with people to solve problems. I was active in student council. I was the president of the college government at Wellesley. And I was really someone who wanted to be part of helping to make things better, as, as maybe simplistic as that sounds. But I saw myself more in the role of an advocate, like one of my great friends and mentors, uh, Marion Wright Edelman. I went to work for her at the precursor to the Children's Defense Fund uh, after my first year in law school, um, or maybe working in government in some way. But I never thought of myself actually running for office. And then in law school, when I met my future husband, uh, it was clear that uh, he was such a natural for that. And, uh, I thought, uh, you know, I could pursue my interests plus uh, support his uh, political ambitions. Taking you back just a little bit, some people who have seen the picture of you campaigning for uh, Goldwater know that you didn't start off as a Democrat, but others may not know that. Could you tell me about your early interest in politics and then what happened? Well, my father was a rock-ribbed conservative Republican, and uh, one of the worst things that you could say in our house was anything positive about any Democrat. So we grew up talking about politics and arguing about politics, and I think the, you know, the gender gap started in families like mine. My father was a Republican, my mother didn't really talk much about politics, but I think she kept canceling out his vote in nearly every election uh, that uh, was held. And when I went to Wellesley, I initially was the president of the college Republicans. And then I got to thinking, you know, I'm not sure I really agree with what the Republican Party uh, in 1969 um, was uh, standing for. And so I, I just, you know, decided that I would begin a search to figure out what I did believe in. I had a very smart uh, political science professor by the name of Alan Schechter, just recently retired who ran uh, a great program, an internship program, in Washington for Wellesley students after their junior year. And I applied for it, and then the question was, okay, you're accepted, where's your placement? And 
people were placed in the executive branch, in the judicial branch, and of course in the Congress. So he assigned me to the House Republican Conference, at that time headed by Gerald Ford, later President Ford. And I, I went in to see him and I said, Professor Schechter, you know, I don't know that I want to be assigned there. And he goes, I want you to really have to decide wh what your beliefs are. So you came into Wellesley thinking you were a Republican. You're going to do this internship. It was a great experience, and it convinced me I was a Democrat. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about Wellesley. I don't know that women today truly understand the transformation that took place when you were in college. Oh. Betsy, it was astonishing what happened the four years I was in college. Because my mother had never gone to college and because my father had gone uh, to Penn State on a football scholarship, they really couldn't guide me very much. You know, they wanted me to go to college, but where, under what circumstances, I didn't know. So I started attending events, and I was really attracted by uh, this team of young women teachers uh, who were in my high school teaching government. And they had gone to uh, women's colleges. So they began talking to me about it and they gave me a lot of information. And they said, look, this is an opportunity for the women to run everything. You run the newspaper, you run the student government, you run all the clubs, you speak out in class. And I had just never thought about that. I had been recruited by some very large co-ed universities uh, for merit scholars and all of that, but I thought, Okay, so I began going to these and I became really intrigued. And I chose Wellesley without ever having visited it because I thought the campus from the pictures as I saw it were so uh, beautiful. So I show up and everyone there seemed much more sophisticated, much more polished, much more educated than I certainly felt. But I found such a home. It was a welcoming, nurturing, challenging environment for me. Now, during my time at Wellesley, uh, Yale went co-ed in the last uh, uh, two years, I guess, that I was there, and, um, or no, right as I was graduating. And so some of my younger friends at Wellesley transferred to Yale to be part of that experience. I saw um, universities making the decision to go from single sex to co-ed. And I remember I was on my way to Yale Law School and, and I got a uh, questionnaire from the uh, Alumni Association of Wellesley. And it was a questionnaire about whether Wellesley should stay uh, all women. And I had complained like so many of my friends. I mean, you know, it was a pain going on dates and there were no men around, men meaning boys our age. And, you know, it was just such a, a constant refrain about why are we at this beautiful place that has only got women. And then when I got this questionnaire, I found myself saying, no, keep Wellesley as special as it is. Keep it as a place where young women can feel as free as we felt to explore you know, frankly, not to get dressed up every day and, you know, try to look good for the guy that you hoped would ask you out yeah. sitting a row over. So I, I really uh, cherish the experience I had. So at that time, the women's movement was in full swing as you were graduating. In what way did it have an impact on you? I am thrilled that I came of age in the 60s. You know, and I get a little annoyed when people, you know, denigrate the 60s and, and kind of character, uh, characterize it as, you know, drug, sex, and, and rock and roll. It was, a, it was about human empowerment and freedom. Now, does freedom sometimes lead some people to go to excess? Unfortunately, yes. And we see that not only in cultural movements, but in political revolutions. That, unfortunately, does go with the territory. But does it also help each person have a firmer grip on the responsibilities he or she faces? That you can't pretend you're not a responsible individual that has to be held accountable for the life decisions you make? Uh, I, I really relished uh, that opportunity. And I think that um, it laid the groundwork for the uh, success of our civil rights movement, as we saw that come that decade come to an end, you know, laid the groundwork for the continuing equality of women and certainly the you know LGBT community and the uh, yeah. people with disabilities. I mean, it really was a liberating phenomenon. 
Now, you faced a decision about relationship. The world was opening up to you. You had a great job in Washington, lots of possibilities, and then you decided that you would go to Arkansas. Well, how, did you, how did you balance your career aspirations with your relationship? Well, I, you know, I, uh, I believed that I um, wanted to have both, that I wanted to have a meaningful uh, relationship that um, I thought would benefit me as a person, that I certainly, you know, fell in love with an extraordinary, complex, dynamic human being uh, that, you know, really forced me to grow, and I, I think vice versa. So it really was a natural choice for me. Now, there were many friends of mine, including a dear, dear friend of mine, Sarah Ehrman, who helped me pack up and drove me to Arkansas, who all along the way was saying, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're getting into? I had no way of predicting it. I didn't know. I couldn't have sat there and said, oh, yes, I'm going to go to Arkansas, and eventually I'm going to marry Bill Clinton, and eventually he's going to become president. No, I mean, I did it because it felt right for me. It was, as has been said before, kind of following my heart. Because I think you want to lead an integrated life, and I think people um, sadly sometimes, you know, live too much in their head or too much in their heart, you know. You need a balance between your reason and your emotion. And I felt very comfortable in kind of taking this leap. So we did uh, get married, and I loved living in Arkansas. I made some of the greatest friends in my life. And it was also a good reminder that the fast track of meritocracy I'd been on, coming from a, you know, middle-class family to a high prestige college and law school, you know, hanging out with, you know, high powered people first, you know, in the Congress on the impeachment inquiry and then in my advocacy work and so much was a real gift. It was a blessing, but it wasn't an end in itself. It was a way of trying to acquire skills and experience that could then be put to work on behalf of other people. So, you know, working at the law schools, teaching there, practicing law, creating organizations like the Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, I felt very much at home. How did you find your balance between the sort of political and ceremonial aspects of being First Lady? <laughs> well, you know, I'd been a First Lady by that time for 12 years in Arkansas, so I was intimately associated with and very supportive of all the ceremonial um, hostess um, aspects of the role. I happened to personally value that and um, relished doing it. Lo and behold, how could I have thought that Washington, D.C. and the White House were in many ways more politically unready than Arkansas? Because by that time, in the group of state first ladies that I was part of, I saw women working. I saw women taking on big jobs. So, unready for what? Well, unready for the nation's first lady to continue working, number one. <clears throat> um, so that I totally accepted and became a full-time volunteer, but unready for a first lady to be uh, involved in the work of her husband on behalf of our country. So I had run this very big enterprise for my husband in Arkansas to reform education and testified before the Arkansas legislature and done hundreds of meetings out in public and came up with a reform agenda, which included raising taxes, and ha it had a, an incredibly positive effect on improving education. Let's talk about what some have called your finding your voice with the UN conference in Beijing. Tell me about that speech and what prompted it. Well, because I had always believed strongly in uh, women's rights, I was interested in supporting um, our national presence in Beijing. And there was a lot of controversy about putting together a delegation, whether we should even go because of Chinese uh, um, detention of uh, Chinese Americans at the time. And when you made the speech, what was the impact? It was far beyond anything I ever could have envisioned. And you know, what seemed to me to be a common sense statement of values and purpose that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights has become a rallying cry. I mean, I still have it uh, recited back to me. I have people in uh, countries around the world standing for hours to see me to tell me how much it meant to them. 
Um, and it became uh, a real organizing principle of much of the rest of my time in the White House, my time in the Senate, now my time as secretary. So let's, let's jump ahead to that. Can you tell me about the call from President Obama? asking you to be Secretary of State and, and the thinking behind your decision to accept that? Well, it was right after the election in uh, early November. As I recall, I think it was the Sunday after the election, and my husband and I were on a long hike in a beautiful reserve near where we live. And uh, like one hour into the hike, uh, the phone in his pocket rings. So he answers it, and it's then President-elect Obama. And he says that he wants to talk to Bill and could, and Bill says, well, you know, I'm kind of in the middle of a hike. It's not a, the best place for me to have a, a, a confidential conversation. So could we talk later? And he said, yes. And he said, um, is Hillary with you? And Bill said, yes. He said, well, would you tell her I want to talk to her too? So this was the Sunday after the election. So we got back to the house and, and Bill, of course, immediately called back <clears throat> the president-elect. And, and the president-elect ran by some names for high positions that he was considering and, and talked to Bill about some of the transition issues. And uh, then said he wanted to talk to me, and he asked me if I would come see him in Chicago later that week. And I, I know it sounds almost hard to believe, but I really did not think he was asking me to come see him to offer me a job. I thought he was asking me to come see him to talk through some of the issues, both the transition issues, the political, mm -hmm. congressional issues. And then I, I began to see you know, little references in the press that maybe the president was gonna ask me to take a job. At the time, I did not want to. And I, you know, I had uh, ended my campaign in June. Uh, both Bill and I then had campaigned very hard to elect President Obama. I really was looking forward to going back to the Senate. I love, love, loved representing New York. And uh, so I really uh, told all my friends uh, that were saying to me, oh, he's gonna, I said, first of all, I do not believe that. And secondly, I do not want to do it, and I will tell him that. So what changed your mind? He was very persuasive, Betsy. What can I tell you? I mean, he raised it with me that Thursday in Chicago, and I said, I really don't want to do it, Mr. President. Here are names of people that I think would be great to do the job. He said, well, I'm not taking that as a no. I want to keep talking to you about it. We had several long conversations. I came up with every possible excuse and demand I could think of. Uh, he batted away the excuses. He agreed with the demands, you know, who I got to hire and access and all the things that you do in these positions. Uh, I talked to several close friends and, of course, my husband and my daughter. Uh, they were supportive of my doing it, and eventually I said okay, and it's been a great experience. You're the first Secretary of State to put the rights of women and girls really front and center. Can you tell me about why? Well, first of all, I think making the empowerment of women, their political and economic social empowerment uh, as an integral essential part of American foreign policy is the right thing to do. I think it is the moral imperative of the 21st century. If the 19th century was about ending slavery and the 20th century was about ending totalitarianism, the 21st century is about ending the pervasive discrimination and degradation of women and fulfilling their full rights. A lot of people think that gains for women come at the expense of men. How do you convince them otherwise? Well, I think it is self-evident that both men and women, um, if they are empowered with their rights, then have to stand on their own. They have to go to school, get educated, they have to take care of themselves and their families, they have to be active citizens, and I would hope that in the United States, particularly right now with all the challenges we're facing, that both men and women are going to live up to their own potential as Americans. You are now wildly popular around the world, which must be gratifying, <laughs> especially with women. What do you symbolize for women? I think women have seen me now in a very personal way for 20 years. Uh, I've been at the highest levels of American politics. It's amazing now what this instantaneous communication uh, means so that people feel like you are in their living room, you are, are there with them. So I think women relate to what they see as my story. Uh, they often come up to me and ask me, you know, how I did what I did. Uh, and 
there's a, a great hunger, and it may be one of the reasons why you're doing this program, for women to look for examples, role models, mentors, even someone all the way across the ocean. You know, the recent Nobel Prize winner from uh, Yemen, this incredibly brave woman, you know, had a picture of me on her mantle. And I cannot even tell you how honored I was that she would look to me to try to give her courage when she is on the front lines of, you know, bullets and, and clubs. Um, and I think also women know I'm pulling for them. You know, I, I want to see more of the reality of women's lives changed in however much time I've got left on the earth so that I don't continue to cringe at women denied, you know, the right to be whoever God meant them to be. Most meaningful piece of advice you've ever received? I think my mother telling me that I had a choice every day to be uh, an actor, the lead actor in my own life, or just a reactor to what everybody around me did. We know what you wound up doing, but uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh my gosh, I wanted to be an astrophysicist, and I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a teacher, I went through a long list. Accomplishment you're most proud of? My daughter. <laughs> What's your first paying job? Babysitting. What do you do for fun? Oh my gosh, long walks, catching up on sleep, going to the movies, going out to dinner, really normal things that I don't get to do enough uh, when I'm traveling nonstop. Hoping for a grandchild? Yes, but I can't say that because I, you know, I do not want to either jinx it or put pressure on it. <laughs> All right. Madam Secretary, thank you so thank very you. much. What an honor.